and the inventions and aberrations of our own hearts. This so-called relative principle uh, is important because it's strikingly demonstrated in both the first, the second, and the fourth commandments uh, of the Ten Commandments are about worship. Uh, and the second and the fourth commandments are the only commandments that are actually elaborated upon. That is, you have the commandment, but then there's an elaboration on it. Um, uh, for example, the second commandment has to do with idolatry, right? Worshiping God in certain, uh, with the use of, of man-made, man-engineered and designed accoutrements, you know. Okay, we're going to worship God. Are you aware that when um, Israel made the golden calf, they didn't view that as an abandonment of Jehovah, but they viewed it as a way to worship Jehovah. Did you know that? Because, and the reason we know that, is in the passage when the people made the golden calf, Aaron said, let us, um, let us celebrate a festival to the Lord. And when they went into their dancing around the, the golden calf and everything, they viewed that as using the customs and the culture and the accoutrements and the worship arts, if you will, of the societies around them in order to worship God. Isn't that striking? But God said, if you worship me in a way that I have not designated, you've not only wrong, uh, worshipped me wrongly, you've not worshipped me, you've worshipped another God. Now isn't there some judgment to be used? Because if you take it to the full extreme, Maybe we shouldn't have guitars or drums or or a loudspeaker. Yes. Or yes. Uh, or you know, some folks have PowerPoint displays with the words on it. Yeah. Maybe we shouldn't do that because it's not yeah. specifically. So where specific. do you draw the so line? Where do you use your judgment? Yeah. Where do you draw the line? Now, but by the way, there are some from the Reformed world who therefore don't have musical instruments in their worship. Mm -hmm and who sing only the psalms. They sing the psalms a cappella. I joke with some of my Scottish Presbyterian kind of in a straitjacket on this one people. Uh, I, um, I tell them, oh, you had the best instruments in your worship tonight I have ever heard. I have never heard any flute or horn or drum, or piano, or organ, ever produce the harmonies that your voice has produced here tonight. Have you ever heard uh, Scottish and Welsh churches and full-throated singing of hymns, a cappella? You hear things that sounds like flutes. You hear things that sounds like percussion instruments. You hear things in the way they use their voices that <laughs> covers the full spectrum of musical instruments. What I wanted to say to them is, you know, if I had the equipment you guys have, I wouldn't need any of that stuff either. Who needs drums and stuff when you're producing it like that? But we're stupid Americans. We don't have all that. So we have to augment it. <laughs> I had a good time with them. Uh, but the, the point is there are people who take it to those kinds of extremes. But... It appears to me that the issue has to do um, with, with what elements we have in our worship. How we actually do them can have tremendous variety. What about the people in the history of the church who've always taught sitting down? Did you know that that was the main way that the early Hebrew Christians taught? was sitting down, not standing behind a pulpit. You know why? Because that's always the way the rabbis did it in the synagogues. They didn't have pulpits. So, I mean, how far back are you going to go 
And, and, and what are you going to use to measure and regulate uh, those details? But the point is, there was teaching. It could be done behind a pulpit, or it could be done sitting down. Uh, and as far as instrumentation in worship, what about in the Psalms? Psalm 150 is a joking symphonic blowout. Have you ever read Psalm 150? Go home and read it. Last Psalm in the book of Psalms just says, pull out all the stops, bring out the cymbals, bring out the lutes, bring out the harps, bring out, I mean, and it lists a whole bunch of, bring out the horns. I mean, it's, it's like a, um, naming off the sections in the symphony. Uh, so I think that like so many things that are so true, so preciously true in God's Word, it, we can easily push it to an extreme that actually aborts the intent, the meaning, intent. and therefore the very value of that. Is it more the intent of the law, not the letter so much? It can be the letter in the sense of the elements. What are the elements? And you're going to see there's a section, chapter 47 in the Book of Church Order, that brilliantly summarizes that if you want to. I think it's even referenced there in your notes under the regulative principle. And it lists uh, and basically goes through and scours the scriptures to find something done like praying, singing, preaching and teaching, uh, vows, like in the case of membership vows or vows for ordination or vows in marriage. <coughs> uh, so the taking of solemn vows. The... Um, the confessions of sin, confessions of faith, um, the reading of Scripture, um, and again, so the sin. What's it? I was going to say, what about um, administrating the sacraments? Admin administrating the sacraments. Do we have very important? So, like that's one. For example, our church does only certain weeks. Yeah. What do you do with that? Yeah. What do you do with that? Hmm. If you follow the regulative principle, don't they do it? Isn't it prescribed? Yeah. Should we be doing it every week? By the way. Especially when it's one of the top three. That is one of the things. Life. Do you know why we haven't done it? Because we are obsequiously devoted to this thing. <laughs> we bow and scrape before the god TikTok. <laughs> There's so many things though that we, that we experience in, in church that raise a question. I mean, uh, the biggie is Christmas. Nowhere yeah. in scripture yeah. does it. Or say, even, yeah, even yeah, Easter per se. I like yeah. Christmas. A worship, <laughs> you know, a um, celebration of, of the birth of Christ. Mm -hmm. Nowhere. And every Sunday is Easter Sunday because it's on the first day of the week when Jesus yeah. rose from the dead. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let me just say this, brothers. When it comes to this issue of worship and its importance and its supremacy, I'm going to give you a Calvin quote here in a moment that's very riveting. And uh, we need to, um, I'm going to get you out of here on time. But um, let me just say to you that I believe that here's what we need to do. We need to emphasize the principles and be in a state of constant openness to perfection and review and change by the Spirit of God. You know, uh, those of you who came to the um, uh, Joint Reformation Day worship service, remember how that the service was built around the great solas of the Reformation, sola scriptura, the scriptures alone. Um, sola Christus, you know, in Christ alone. Uh, sola fide, through faith alone, sola gratia, by grace alone, sola deo gloria, 
to God only be the glory. But there's a, uh, in that second generation of the Reformation in Europe and Britain, there was another little Latin slogan of the Reformation. Ecclesia semper reformanda est. The church is always reforming. Ecclesia semper reformanda est. And the French Reformed Church actually adopted a variation of it as the motto of the French Church, which was uh, Ecclesia Reformata um, Semper Reformanda, meaning uh, the Reformed Church, comma, always reforming. In other words, what that says is we never arrive. You see that point? We don't ever have it together. There's always something we need to repent of. There's always something we need to address, not just individually, but collectively. Do you have re repentance material in your lives right now? Things that you need to be confessing to God? Of course you do. <laughs> like somebody said, very often a clear conscience is nothing more than a bad memory. You know, we just need to remember better. Well, that's not just true of us individually. That's true of us collectively. Do not be deceived. You're moving into to leadership in a church that is not perfect yet. We have not arrived. We have defects. If you hang around for a while, some of them could get pretty glaring. And you've touched the raw nerve of one of them that has concerned me off and on for some time. Suppose I'm the Pope and everybody kisses my ring and nobody bows and scrapes before the god TikTok. I would have communion at the end of every worship service that we ever have together. Morning, evening, midweek. Because the Lord's table, that sacrament, is the high water mark. It's the gathering together up of all of the pieces of our worship in a, a, a crescendo. We're going to get into that um, in a subsequent lesson when we get into the sacraments. But it is the capstone. And so I'm afraid that, uh, that very frequently in our worship we lead people up the mountain but we don't take them to the crest. What was your experience in the other churches that you didn't have the sacrament? Same there? as here. Same as here. They were also devotees of the god TikTok. <laughs> but but seriously, why else would we not do it? Mm -hmm. That's what happens is we're we're trying to keep our, our services short, and you you went off and got this long-winded preacher who added insult to injury to the whole problem, and just antagonized it enormously. So what are you going to do about that? <laughs> well, you knew in in. Uh, Speaking against doing it every time we get together uh -huh. is it dilutes the meaning yes. of the sacrament. And that is what I thought for a long time, I must say. And many do as well. You're not alone in that, in raising that objection. It's a logical objection. But here's the thing that I've noticed in uh, some places where they have gone. There are churches in the PCA that do it every uh, have the sacrament every time they have a worship service. And <clears throat> what they have noticed over time, and it wasn't something they noticed initially, but over over time it it became richer and deeper for their people. It wasn't that, that they just had 
uh, lots more at this level. The people's experience of it, understanding of it, appreciation for it, went deeper and deeper. In a stair-stepped way, it's not a straight line. But they noticed, uh, as they examined their own hearts and their own experience, as they interviewed their people about it and whatnot, uh, that began to happen. The, the, the subtle nuances and the variability, it, was, it became, uh, let me use an analogy, um, I don't like caviar. I don't know if any of you like caviar. Don't know. Never had it. Okay. Almost no one likes caviar the first time that they have caviar. Uh, it is an acquired taste. And the, the connoisseurs of fine caviar say that the more they eat it, the more their palate develops a taste for it and a hunger for it. I can't speak to that by my experience, but that's what's reported and widely known in the world of culinary experts. Well, <clears throat> can I say one thing in my yeah. experience? Uh, when Liz and I first got married, she was attending the Episcopal Church. Okay. And uh, we'd go to the church and uh, they'd bring out the prayer book and nobody would look at it because they had it memorized. Mm. And they were just mouthing the words and there was no feeling. Yeah. I mean, wonderful words. Yes. Meaning and, and everything. But yes. it was just dead yes. conversation. Yes. And um, let me ask you that, something. That the other thing and when they, they came in carrying the cross, everybody had to bow. That just turned me right off. I said, I ain't bound to any metal made man made thing. Yeah. Yeah. Period. I got you. Yes. Any there is there is literally nothing in the entire constellation of God-ordained means of grace that man cannot twist and pervert and mangle beyond recognition. I totally, and, 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 and that is a warning for us in, in every area. I'll, I'll give you an example. Presbyterians are sermonaholics. I mean, if there is one thing that we do well, you know, we, you know we're pretty, you know, we're connoisseurs of, of fine preaching. Not everywhere, but pretty much. If you stack this up with the rest of the body of Christ, we're very cerebral. You know, give me something. Thy word have I hid in my notebook. You know, this is sort of the <laughs> Presbyterian perversion of that verse, thy word have I hid in my heart. Well, the point is that um, um, we can take any good thing and overemphasize it, underemphasize it, make it mechanical and routine. We can, um, you can do that with amazing grace. You just sing it over and 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 over again and, and, and it becomes, you know, what Jesus described as vain repetition. So, um, and, and everything, by the way, is in danger of us doing that. So, now, let me hasten to add, though, that the point you've raised there, Jim, is not utterly without warrant for consideration. It just needs to be laid alongside a, a, a thorough uh, examination of the subject. Most of I came from a church in Seattle that had, had a community every, every week, and at first it was like, it was unusual. And the pastor even wore a robe. I mean, it was it was a definitely a, a conservative church. But the way it was administered was unlike any church I'd ever been to. Most of the churches say, you know, reflect self reflection and some churches I've been to even said, you know, don't take partake in the sacrament if you're having confessed your sins or if there's something going on in your life. I'd let it pass by. But this church administered it in and the name of the church was Exile, so but it was meant every week you're coming and you're in exile, uh, going on our sojourn, and we need that ref refreshment from the Lord. And we need it regularly, mm -hmm. just to give us strength and to renew our spirit. And we go to God for that monarch from heaven. And that was administered every week as a reminder of that. And it was really elevated the sacraments higher. And, um, and it really became something that we, we looked forward to. Huh. You know, it's one of the things we do miss from that last church, but it took some time, as you mentioned, 
And it was just in the manner in which it was presented. It was meant to, re, you know. Did you, us. by the way, did you go forward there? Was it brought to you? Uh, it, you was, um, it was passed around, I think. Okay. I think so, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, that was just a, a little curiosity on my part. I think it can be done either way. That's another example. See, the the form, the function, has to guide the form, not the other way around. Right. Absolutizing form ends up in actually destroying the function. Function has to keep keep center states, and that's why, with those elements and whatnot, the methodology in doing it, there's some room for flexibility, right. as long as you can uh, examine that against. Uh, are there any principles that are being neglected or abused in any way in this method of living out that form? But, you know, we hear about, you know, every day we wake up and we eat breakfast. We have to eat breakfast to, to live. Or we, we drink water to live. We have bread to live. And, and then there's a lot of emphasis on reading your Bible every day. Why wouldn't you just as equally partake of the sacrament weekly on the Lord's Day to replenish you, you know, to provide strength? And, and, uh, I have found... Quite frankly, that the arguments uh, for more regular um, celebration of the sacrament are greater than those against it. Um, and, but I'm caught in the no man's land in between, be between my own sense about that and certain practicalities and the history and pattern of our church and stuff like that. But the church has changed in other ways. We could change in that way. Pray for us. Help us. Come. Assist us. Get there where God wants us. <laughs> Sometimes tradition's a terrible thing. Isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. All right, let me finish up. All right, here we go. So Calvin, you see that Diet of Spires quote of Calvin? You see that in your notes? Uh, he said, The integrity of the Christian faith in any society is maintained by sound adherence to two things, and everything else is subsumed under these two categories of knowledge. Wow, to set us up on that one, Calvin, what are these two things? Notice he says, the manner in which God is duly worshipped and the source from which salvation is obtained. Now, do you notice here that he put the, uh, the uh, worship ahead of salvation in his order? You see, Reformed scholars, here's one of your blanks, Reformed scholars saw salvation primarily in terms of deliverance from idolatry, the healing of our worship disorder. You remember how we talked about that, about idolatry, and that's the core of all sin and so forth, deliverance from idolatry. Whereas the Lutherans saw salvation primarily as deliverance from works, a works-based approach to God. Now, it's really both, isn't it? They're two sides of the same coin. But the continental reformers who called themselves Protestants, they saw that the main thing that they were protesting was the worship of God in any way not prescribed by Him. And so they saw departure from bibli the biblically prescribed means of worship as the same thing as departure from the biblical God. And that's the meaning of that uh, second commandment, the first commandment of the ten, who we're to worship, the second commandment of the ten, how we are to worship. It's not only possible to worship false gods, we can worship the true God falsely. Now, what follows uh, is a, a, a pamphlet almost put in your notes for you, and I'm not going to go through this, an attempt to try to, to take the regulative principle and walk through it in terms of actual practice and guiding principles. And this is something that I worked on literally for years and finally reduced to writing um, about 10 years or so ago. Um, and I've gone back and, and changed a little bit here and there along the way. But it's very succinct. It's deliberately tight. It's not very long. But I think that you will find this helpful. And what you will begin to see is you'll begin to see, oh, that's why our worship services are designed the way they are. Oh, I get it. Now, I took a version of this and produced a trifold pamphlet that I don't know if we may have used them all up and they may not be out there in the narthex. 
for the consumption of the general public. But this has got a little bit more details than that pamphlet has, and I strongly encourage you to take, you probably read it in 10 minutes or less. Read through that, and I, and I think you're going to see, oh, I get how that is a practical outworking of this great Reformation principle called the regulative principle of worship. It's rooted, of course, in the first two commandments of the Ten Commandments. All right, it's three minutes over. Let me let you go. Lord, thank you for our time together tonight. Thank you for the good, brisk discussion we had on some of these things. And Lord, you know that we need to lay hold of that great Reformation principle, Ecclesia Semper Reformanda Est. The church is always reforming. We can, we've never arrived. We can never rest on our laurels. We can never say, oh, we have it sewn up now. There will always be room for growth, needed change, things we need to repent about, things we need to stop doing, things we need to start doing. We ask you, Lord, help us as a church and even through these brothers here as they move into leadership roles of various kinds. Use them to help us move the ball a few more yards down the field as we seek to be more like Jesus, as we seek to be, as we do, we were describing earlier, Incarnation 2.0. Make that powerfully, powerfully real in the lives of many for your glory in this place. In Jesus' name.